So, public key cryptography solves all our security needs. We've got public key encryption to solve our confidentiality needs, and we've got um, public key digital signatures to solve our integrity needs. So all we've got to do is availability, we're done, right? Well, no, we've not even solved confidentiality or integrity yet because public key cryptography depends upon everybody knowing the public key of the other party they want to interact with. And this brings us back to the idea of cryptography as a type of problem compression. Cryptography is very good at making really big problems into really small problems. I can encrypt a DVD and then I can keep the confidentiality of that DVD just by passing a 256-bit key instead of 10 gigabytes of data. But I've still got the problem of how I exchange that key. And it's the same thing with public key cryptography. All it's doing is reducing the scope of the problem, it's not eliminating it. We've still got to have a mechanism to distribute those public keys. So how do we go about it? Well, one way that we can go about it is by a mechanism that's called direct trust. So if Alice wants to talk to Bob, Alice gives Bob her public key when they meet, and then when Bob wants to talk to Alice, he can send, uh, he knows the public key and so everybody has their own contacts book and keeps track of everybody else's uh, public key which actually is more practical than it sounds in fact this is exactly how most people use open pgp um, they put the instead of using public keys we use the uh, fingerprint the message digest of the public key but you can put your pgp fingerprint on a business card and you know, people can then send send you email. It, it works really fine, but it doesn't really scale. If we want to provide security at internet scale, we have to have an infrastructure that 5 billion people can use, and PGP has got between 1 and 2 million users. So it's significant, but it's not really there. We're going to need to have infrastructure if we're going to get there. And so the, there are many approaches, and I'll come back to Web of Trust and so on at the end of this video, um, but they all share some common features under the hood. And the origins of those, um, those features turns out to be an MIT undergraduate thesis. It was a bachelor's, not a master's, I misspoke last time. Uh, written by Lauren Kohnfelder at MIT. And this is one of those uh, you know, student theses that's created billion dollar industries, you know, like the FedEx one that uh, was rejected for the MBA course that turned into... Um... So what, what did Kohnfelder propose? Well, first, it, when, when I'm talking about a solution, it's usually, usually best to explain what the functionality it is, is that's delivered first and then explain how we go about it. So what we're after is a telephone book for PKI so that instead of looking at people's telephone numbers in the, the book, so instead of Alice going to a telephone number, the telephone book is going to go Alice to a public key. And so if Bob wants to talk to Alice, he, he looks up Alice's public key in the telephone book. And we can make this a digital document and we can sign it with a digital signature. And that would be one way of solving the problem. And in fact, there are certain applications, uh, the RPKI would probably be a lot simpler if we used something closer to that technology than what was actually used uh, in practice. Um, the, Alice and Bob, to talk, they only need to know the digital signature public key of the publisher of the telephone book. Or maybe they might need 5, 10, maybe 20, 30 uh, public keys of all the different publishers of the different telephone books if there's more than one publisher. And this is, you know, that would be one way of doing it. But it's not a very good way. 
And the problem that comes up is, well, this book, it's really big. How often does it get updated? Do we update it once a year? Well, if Alice gets a new email address and a new public key, uh, she's got to wait a year. So we want to have frequent updates to the telephone book. Um, once a, a month, well, that's still pretty long. Once a week, once a day, once an hour. Um, this is going to be a big book with five billion names in it. Um, so this really doesn't scale. Uh, and the other problem that we've got is what happens if Alice loses her private key? Uh, she knows that her phone has been lost uh, or, or stolen and she knows that Mallet has hold of a private key. How does she tell everybody to stop using it? How do we remove entries from the book? So the telephone entry really, do, telephone book doesn't really work. What we want is a solution that's more granular. And what Kernfelder proposed was let's make the granularity of the signature the individual entry in the book. So what we do is that instead of signing the whole book, we have a separate signature for each line, each entry in the book. So, and we call this a certificate. And in X509 V1, which is the, you know, the most widely used version of PKI uh, that came most directly from Kernfelder's work, we call this a certificate. In V1, we have a serial number, we have an issue date, we have an expiry date, we have a subject name, we have an issuer name, we have a subject public key, and we have a um, signature around this whole thing. And it, it works. Um, it turned out to not be quite uh, flexible enough. So the modern version of PKI we use is called X509 version 3. And that also allows us to insert what are called attributes, which allows us to make other statements about Alice or Bob or whoever's certificate it is. Um, and actually, when we actually go to PKX proper in a separate module, we'll see that actually the attributes turn out to be where the names are stored rather than what are called the name fields. Okay, so the telephone book publisher becomes the publisher of certificates. And these are called certificate authorities. So this is the point at which uh, the course comes to my subject matter expertise, which is running certificate authorities. Uh, I spent 10 years as principal scientist at VeriSign and then another 10 years as principal scientist at Komodo, which at the time I was working for them were both the largest CA in, in the world. And be, running a certificate authority turns out to be harder than it appears because you know, I said that cryptography doesn't actually solve any problem. All it does is to make the pro big problems smaller, which is useful, but still leaves you with a problem. Well, the problem that PKI does not solve, or at least the cryptography doesn't solve, is the question of how to make sure that Alice really is Alice. Or the party that is applying for an Alice certificate really is Alice. This is really Alice's public key and all that. Cryptography can help, but you've still got that essential core that remains of somebody's got to curate these certificates according to some rules. And how do you hold those uh, that party accountable? How do you know that the trust that they're providing is adequate for the purpose that you want to use it for? And so running a certificate authority is quite a subtle business and it involves much more than just technology. It also involves practices and we'll come back to that a bit later. So to issue a certificate, the CA is going to check Alice's credentials. If the credentials pass the validation criteria, they will create a certificate and sign it with their CA key. And so now we have a portable credential that anybody can read that will tell um, tell them this is Alice's key and this is something that Alice can now uh, she could post it on a uh, notice board uh, she can send it in an email to somebody she's talking with uh, she can send it in the channel in a TLS conversation 
This is something that can be transported and used in a protocol without having to go back to the certificate authority that issued it. So that's one part of PKI, which is the granting of trust. The other important part of PKI, equally important, is the removing of trust when it turns out that a trust assertion is no longer valid. And this can happen for a number of reasons. Alice could lose her private key. Uh, you know, it could be disclosed to Mallet or whatever. Um, the CA could discover that uh, it wasn't Alice that applied in the first place. Uh, there might be some other criteria required for maintaining a certificate, like not signing malware with it. And Alice might uh, breach one of those conditions. And in any of those cases, we want to be able to revoke a certificate. Now, we've got a couple of options here. One of them is we can simply wait until the certificate expires. And at the time that Kohnfelder was uh, making this proposal, uh, it was thought that the certificates will be valid for a year or two years or three years. And so that really wasn't an acceptable solution. So we want a way of revoking the certificate sooner. And so what the CA would do is to periodically uh, issue a list of the serial numbers of all the certificates that had been revoked. And this is called a certificate revocation list or a CRL, sometimes called a curl or a CURL or whatever. And so if you ever used a uh, credit card in the 1970s, when they were just starting to become popular, uh, the cashier would have a, th th there would be a little uh, sticky note uh, taped to the side of the cash register with the list of the bad credit card numbers uh, that were being used for fraud. And they would check up the uh, credit card number on that list before uh, you made the purchase before allowing the purchase. Same idea as the CRL. Okay, so these are the basis of X509 version 1 PKI. Um, we've since moved on to version 3 uh, PKI, uh, but we've also, but we no longer actually use X509. That's the ITU version of the specification. The internet actually runs on a different specification called PKIX, which is allegedly the ITF profile of X509 v3. In practice, it's a different standards body has taken over the maintenance of that standard. And they call it public key infrastructure X509 uh, or PKIX for short. So if people are talking about PKIX, PKI, today that can be used essentially interchangeably with X509 v3 certificates, uh, because chances are if somebody's using X509 v3 certificates, they're following the ITF spec, not the uh, remaining ITU uh, work. And PKIX is a really large specification with many moving parts. And later on, I'll probably be making a multiple episodes on each of those moving parts. So what I'm going to give you here, though, is the you know, the 5,000 foot view of how the pieces are meant to fit together. So one detail that comes up is certificate chains. So in the original Kohnfelder PKI, uh, everybody would know the CA public key and the that would be used to sign certificates for Alice, Bob and so on. In X509 terms, we call those the end users. And the CA key is known as a root key. Well, how do we move that root key about? I mean, like, you know, we've decided we're going to use certificates for end user keys. How are we going to package that up? Well, the obvious format to use is a certificate. But then we've got the problem, you know, who's going to sign it? And, well, there's only one key that we can use at this point to sign that certificate. And that is the root key or itself. And so... Uh, CA root keys are self-signed certificates. This doesn't actually provide any trust whatsoever. The only trust that you get from a CA root key is through the distribution chain of the CA root. And 
again, that's probably going to be the subject of at least one episode in the future and quite possibly quite more than one. And so here's the thing. PKIX does not actually cover root certificates, which is a problem because it doesn't cover them only it does sort of but the specification doesn't say anything about how to handle them or whatever so root keys are very precious though uh, if you're looking at something like the web pki you've got multiple certificate authorities out there uh, many of which have uh, revenues in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year and ultimately all those revenues depend upon having that root key uh, inserted into a large number of applications that rely on it, the relying applications. And so uh, those root keys are fantastically valuable. Uh, and sometimes they trade, you know, that sometimes they're bought and sold and they can trade for, you know, tens of millions of dollars. So you really want to make sure that your root key cannot ever possibly be compromised. And you certainly never want to have the private key of your CA root ever to be on any device that has ever been connected to the internet. And so what we want to do is to have the CA root key only be used in a carefully controlled uh, multi-tier security uh, uh, facility that has a large amount of physical security uh, protecting it, you know, guards, biometric scanners, uh, all, all that stuff. Uh, we want to keep it in a safe almost all the time and only bring it out occasionally. We do not want that root key to ever trust the internet, uh, to, to touch the internet. We want it to be an offline route, which means we're going to have to have some other online key to do the actual job of signing and entity certificates and so what we end up with is a certificate chain where we have the root key which sits in the vault which doesn't count for pkix we have the intermediate certificate and then we have the end entity certificate and so we have a certificate chain and then we get into what's called path math which is checking the validity of the chain. I, for a start, we want the, uh, each key to be signed by the subject key of the previous link in the chain. Uh, if we have a large number of possibilities, we've got to work out which certificate might be involved and so on. And so, again, another episode down the line. And these chains, uh, the minimum chain uh, for the web PKI is two plus one so the root key and then an intermediate and one entity and entity key um, but it can be much larger longer um, we often create um, intermediate routes for affiliate uh, CAs that operate uh, as a subordinate CA to some other you know, as I say getting your root key embedded is, is expensive and so there's this thing called cross certification where we create more, uh, we, we delegate trust to new CAs. But PKIX only has, two, only deals with two types of keys. We have the certificate signing keys, which are for the intermediate certificates. And then we have the end entity keys. And one critical thing with uh, PKIX is that an end entity certificate is not allowed to sign anything else you have to have a CA certificate or an intermediate certificate in order to do that. And that actually leads to a lot of complaints about the model and politics and that sort of thing. So the shortest peak exchange is a root plus two certificates, but we can go longer if we have more intermediates. Now in 1995, when we are starting uh, this whole business, uh, you're pretty much limited to a maximum chain length of three and that was because the machines of the day were just not powerful enough to process long certificate chains. Today, we can use longer chains for certain applications, but there's some applications out there that still have some, uh, some constraints that are more severe than we would want. 
Another reason that we often use a, an intermediate certificate without delegating trust to another party is when we create a local registration authority. Okay, so why would you want an LRA? Well, LRAs are particularly useful when you want to hand out certificate to people rather than to internet services. Uh, so say you've got a university and you want to issue a digital certificate to every student at the university. Or you've got a company and you want to issue a certificate to every person employed by that per company at a particular site. Well, you're probably not going to want to spin up a full CA, have all the physical security, etc. that you require to manage a root certificate. So you're probably going to want to outsource that part of the work and the actual creation of the certificates. But you're going to need as but the certificate authority is only going to be able to issue the certificate. They're not going to be able to um, decide whether they won't know your employees, your students or anything. The only thing that they will know is that these requests all came from this university or this particular company or whatever. So if we're looking at, e at uh, email um, accounts, you know, the domain name, you know, the MIT.edu part, you know, the certificate authority can check, yes, the LRA for MIT um, made this request. They can validate that part of the certificate request, but they can't say, well, this is Alice, Bob, Carol or whatever. That's going to have to happen locally. And so what a local registration authority does is it gives, uh, that's a separate uh, facility that is in charge of one specific part of the certificate validation process that performs the validation process itself and then sends the conclusion back to the actual CA that is at a remote location. And so quite often we uh, issue an intermediate, uh, what's called an intermediate certificate uh, for that process. And that has an advantage because it get, provides a really easy way for the um, the party, the, 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 the uh, university or the company or whatever, to check, ah, oh, this is a certificate that was issued to one of our people, we'll let them into our general purpose servers. Uh, you know, can we have a first step on authorization by the fact that uh, the um, the request is authenticated from that uh, intermediate uh, CA. What creating and using an RA does not do is to delegate the issuing authority because the LRA does not have a signing key by definition and so an LRA cannot create any certificate unless the CA approves it. And this led to a, um, a fracas uh, 10 years ago that still has um, repercussions to today in that uh, there's a lot of people out there who will blather on saying there are 650 CAs. And no, there aren't. No, that wasn't a lie. And it's a lie that really I find very sad because it's a lie that was told by the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is uh, an organization that I would like to have a lot of respect for. But, you know, if you keep telling lies, I can't respect you. Sorry. Uh, what they did was that they mapped out the whole structure of public CA space for the web PKI. And then they identified all the certificates where you had an intermediate certificate uh, where the subject name on that intermediate did not m match the issuer name. And they called that a certificate authority. And then they said, look, there are 650 people out there, 650 organizations who have the power to, to sign digital certificates. And made a big fuss and raised a lot of money. This was a fundraising thing, mind you. Um, and it wasn't true. Uh, and they were told it wasn't true and they continued to insist. No, these are CAs. No, they're not CAs. A certificate authority uh, has the ability to sign digital certificates. The intermediates do not have the ability to sign 
uh, digital certificates unless it's a very rare type of certificate called a cross certificate and you cannot look at the certificates out on the public web and distinguish one from the other and this was explained to them uh, but they can and the unforgivable part here was that they insist continued to insist there are 650 parties who can sign certificates and that is you know you can you, you can say well they're getting the nomenclature wrong well no they were also making a political statement that there's too many parties out there uh, that can sign certificates uh, the the true number is that there's about 50 CAs at any time that have the ability to operate and at any time there's roughly half that number that are op actually operating there are reasons why there are more CA routes than CAs but so and and we can see and this should have been uh, clear to them uh, here's the map that they produced and as you can see in the middle here there's a a, a node that has an enormous number of uh, arcs coming out of it and that is DFN and you know if, if, if I had a data set where one third of all my nodes uh, connected up to one other node and I was making a point you know, wouldn't you go and check wouldn't you find out what's going on with DFN wouldn't you call them up and ask do you allow you know have you created 200 cross certificates uh, have you actually delegated your route this number of times and created this number of signing keys uh, and so I called up DFN and what DFN is, is it's a specialist CA that serves the German university system. And it's simply their policy for each university that is part of their system. They issue an intermediate certificate and they have their own LRA, but they do not have their own CA. They do not have the signing key. They do not have the signing authority. And so if you take those 200 CAs out, well, we go down from uh, 650 to 450 straight away. And if you look at most of the other uh, nodes in the net, it's the same story. So PKI just involves a lot of politics. And the reason for that is simple. PKI is potentially one of the two major control points for the internet. The other very visible one is the DNS. Uh, if you can control either the DNS or the PKI, then you can control who can talk to whom on the internet. And so where you have those control points, you, you have very high stakes and you have people who want to be able to control what is going on. And sometimes they want to have control to protect themselves and sometimes they want control to harm others. And so, you know, politics are just inescapable. Another aspect of the PKIX model that attracts a lot of political arguments is the revocation infrastructure. And we'll come back to that in, because it, it, it will need a whole episode in its own right. But the long and the short of it is that, well, CRLs don't really work. The uh, list of bad credit card numbers that was taped to the side of the cash register well that lasted for about a year uh, after a year it had turned from a sticker to a book that was tied to the cash register by a string and then the booklet became a thick book uh, stored in a drawer underneath and then the booklet eventually disappeared and turned into the Verifone terminal. And so every time you went into a store and made a card presence purchase, they would swipe your card through the terminal and enter the amount to pay. And that would ping a service uh, that would tell the uh, store whether or not the card was uh, valid or not. A lot of people think that that was actually making the payment turns out that that's not true there's a separate transaction uh, where the um, transaction the separate process where you actually run the transactions through called collection interesting so yes yeah, CRLs don't work uh, we tried many times to resurrect them uh, we 
we had schemes such as Delta CRLs where we say, okay, instead of sending out the entire CRL every week, we will have a checkpoint that we produce once a week and then every day we will send just the Delta. So instead of having to send out the whole thing every day, we just send out the whole thing once a week and then the increments. Uh, there are partitions, there are spans. Uh, there's even uh, a proposal to compress CRLs. And if you think about it, you know, co the CRL consists of a list of serial numbers. Certificate serial numbers are required to be large random numbers. So it turns out that you can actually compress lists of random numbers. You wouldn't think you could do that, but it turns out you can. And but eventually, of course, the uh, CRLs turned into uh, an online service. And this was, uh, the progenitor of that was uh, my colleague at uh, VeriSign, Mike Myers, uh, who put together OCSP, Online Certificate Status Protocol. So this is a little web service that when you have a relying application is looking at certificate, trying to see whether it's valid, it pings the uh, a, a, a remote service might be run by the CA, might be run by some other party, and get back comes a response saying yes, it's valid or no, it isn't, and that's signed by the CA. And so that's basically been the workhorse for revocation on the internet for you know the past uh, twenty years since it was invented. Uh, but there are complaints about that as well, particularly uh, coming from Google, which is obsessed by the idea of making the latency of the browser as small as possible. They want their pages to appear to load instantaneously. And obviously, going off to OCSP servers, uh, that gets in their way. Um, so there's so most of the web browsers uh, that are out there actually check the certificate status after they display the page, which, yeah, that's a bit odd. But we'll get back to that in uh, revocation. Uh, but one thing I will just point out, once you've got certificates, CRLs, and OCSP, we've now got three separate infrastructures that are all about issuing trust that were developed at different times with different people involved uh, that use different styles of using, of encoding and different. It's become quite a bit of a mess. And this is the, one of the biggest complaints with PKIX. It's that, you know, it's a an elderly internet standard. Um, it's been around for over 30 years now. And it's starting to show its age because it's just been patched by so many different authors. Uh, I didn't invent PKIX. I spent most of my time being one of the people who tried to patch it. And that gets harder and harder each time you make a change. One of the things that uh, people are looking at is they're saying, well, if you have to go to this OCSP server each time, well, couldn't you just issue a new certificate once a day? And in the 1990s, when PKI and the web PKI were just being started, that would have been impossible. Today, with modern technology, that's actually quite easy. And so uh, there is actually a trend towards uh, shortening the certificate lifespan. Um, you know, some CAs have limited it to 90 days, but I think that we should be limiting certificates to a day. Make it three days so that you, know, you can account for clocks here, but basically issue a new certificate every day. And then to revoke a certificate, you just stop issuing them for that particular um, subject. So there's more complexity there. We'll come back to revocation it's own right later on. So yes, PKIX, it works, and that's the best that you can say for it. It doesn't work in a way that anybody sane would be happy with. But you know, at the end of the day, none of the alternatives work as well. And there are problems with those as well. One of the most frequent complaints that's leveled against PKIX is that it uses a syntax called ASN1 and people really don't like ASN1 syntax. Um, it wasn't a bad idea. The idea of ASN1 was really smart. 
the problem was it went into a standards process as a good idea uh, and there was a committee that had a really bad idea that turned it into something that's just awful and we'll go into the sad story of ASN1 at some point as well. Uh, and then the other problem, the other set of criticism is really criticism about PKI in general in that there's never the right number of CAs. There are always too many or too few. Uh, the people who are saying them there are too many, well, some of them are working off that bogus uh, calumny of the EFF saying that seek 750, but you know, some people say that the 50 uh, routes that are actually embedded in the browser, that's too many. And then there are folk that are saying, well, yeah, but although there are 50 routes, there are only uh, two major CAs, two major commercial CAs and one free one that account for almost all the certificates issued. So you've got a duopoly there. Um, you know, there should be more issuers. Um, they're too big to fail. And then finally, there are folk that say, well, there should just be one. And those people, for some reason, the folk who say there should just be one CA, they always think that they should be the people who do it. And so there's this system, DNSSEC, where that's kind of that, the idea. Uh, but I think a bigger problem with PKIX is it was designed for a particular set of circumstances in the 1990s. And those circumstances has changed since. And when we were designing it, we were designing it for the web PKI, which in turn was designed for internet commerce to enable people to buy and sell online, to enable the likes of Amazon and eBay and so on. And when you take that infrastructure, which has a certain set of concerns about liability, accreditation of the process, not the outcome, four corners, certificate policy, certificate practices, statements, audit, validation criteria, insurance, and relying party agreements. That's a lot of legal infrastructure, which is necessary when you're designing a system that's going to allow a person to give money to somebody that they've never met with the expectation that that person is going to send them something back through the mail or FedEx or whatever. All that mechanism is not relevant when I'm trying to secure a conversation with my thermostat. And so part of the problem with PKIX is that we've deployed it in a particular way for a particular set of problems, and those problems aren't the only problems we have. And so what we really need to do is to look forward to models that suit those applications better. And it's at this point I'll point out that, yes, there are other models of PKI around there. Uh, PGP, uh, most people today use it using fingerprints and direct trust to exchange credentials. But there's also this thing called the web of trust, which is another way of uh, creating a CA infrastructure. Uh, there's a system called SAML, which isn't thought of as a PKI, but was actually originally uh, developed from a specification that was originally proposed as a replacement for PKIX, PKIX and XML. But those solutions aren't complete either in that, you know, the basis of the Kohnfelder thesis, you know, the Kohnfelder thesis in the 1970s and PKIX and all that, People are using 1980s technology and we've got year 2020 problems. I think that if we're going to improve on PKI, we need to look past the technology of the 1980s and start to look at new cryptography as well as new trust structures and new trust topologies. Um, another thing we've got to look at is the fact that these days, We've got more opportunities. Most of us carry these things around with us. And so we've got a camera that we're carrying. The camera can read QR codes. And so now when Alice and Bob meet, we can make a credential exchange much easier by means of near field communication, Bluetooth and so on. 
So what I'm trying to get at here is, yes, we do need to reform PKI, but don't think of it in terms of VHS or Betamax. Think of it in terms of going to the next format altogether, DVD, Blu-ray and internet distribution. So that completes uh, the first part of COVID cryptography. I've given you the basis or basics of commercial cryptography as it is practiced out there in the field. And I've been trying to give you the essentials with no added fat. And so at this point on, uh, what I want to do is to go back and cover some of the things we skipped over as details that we could elide for the moment and look at those in details. Because some of those details are pretty interesting. What I also want to be able to do is to start covering events in the field as they happen. I've done that with some of the bonus episodes on the Apple Google tracing uh, application um, and the Zoom uh, conferencing security. And so I want to do more of that. But the other thing I want to do is to cover new proposals, um, things that are not being used as part of the crypto canon today but definitely should be, or sh definitely should be considered. Uh, and from this point on, because you, I've given you all the basis, whereas if we do have to go for a, sequentially, as you know, we need to start at work factor, do zero key, one key, two key cryptography, um, PKI, because they all, they're all interdependent. There's a natural sequence. From this point on, I'm going to use this basic uh, course as the core assumption from which I build the, the future episodes on. So the future episodes are not going to be sequentially dependent. However, having said that, what I want to take, go to next is, I want to go to a new proposal, but a new proposal that follows logically from the previous course. We did no key cryptography, the message digest, one key, symmetric cryptography, two key, public key cryptography. What I want to do next is three key cryptography. Why is that useful? Well, three key cryptography is all about splitting up private keys and doing math on private keys. And this is a type of cryptography called threshold cryptography, which isn't in use in the field today, but is starting to be looked at as the next thing that um, the, the next place where the field is going to go. NIST has just started uh, a program uh, soliciting views on threshold cryptography. Uh, we're starting to propose work in the IRTF on threshold algorithms. So please click like, please subscribe to my channel, and please join me for the first episode of PHB Security, which is going to be all about threshold. Thank you very much for watching.